Yuhan, are you there? Yes. All right, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can now. You can see all the questions on it? Uh, if it's two, then yes. It's two, yeah. There's a little black band at the top that I can't, um, I can't quite figure out how to get rid of that, but this is the whole, on the bottom, you can see the whole slide. You can go ahead and start answering those two questions and you can just answer them in the chat. I'll give you, actually, you don't even need to type it. Um, do you know what in medias race is? Boredom, isn't it like something to do with like the middle of a like a story? Yes, it means in the middle of things, in the middle of things. So um, if a story starts in medias race, it means it starts right in the middle of an act of the action. So why do you think an author might do use in medias race in the beginning? Maybe to get readers like more excited or hooked on the book. Yeah. Okay. Nice answer. Let me see what I said. I put I put my answer here. Yep. I also added to build curiosity. Do you remember last week how we didn't actually see Francis um, be a coward during the lion hunt? Yes. So that started in medias race and it made us wonder what happened. All right, what about, what's a flashback? Like when the books sort of, did it, the author just says like some event that happened in the past? Maybe? Good, yep. And why would someone use a flashback? To give context? Yeah, absolutely. Same thing what I said. Um, I said to explore motivations for characters and previous events, key to understanding the meaning and the theme. Context, I agree with that too. Okay, you know me. Um, this is for people on YouTube. My, my name is Kirsty Pillow. Um, I went to St. John's College. I have a Bachelor of the Arts in, ed, in um, Liberal Arts. And then I have a Master's in Education from Harvard. And I taught at high school in New Orleans for a long time. And I'm really excited to be here. Okay, Yuhan, you are in our Google Classroom. And we talked last week about the more time that you spend reading challenging text, the better your reading comprehension gets. And we are making a lot of work this week, noticing choices that authors are making. Last week, we noticed choices that Hemingway made around characterization. Do you remember the clothing that we talked about? Sorry, my mom was calling me for something. What was that again? <laughs> it's okay. Do you remember last week how we were noticing the differences in clothing? Yes. Can you briefly explain what we noticed with that, the, that choice that Hemingway made? What was he trying to do with his characters? He was trying to show that um, they were like vastly different in experience and maybe like uh, economy wise, like the amount of money. Yeah and just through clothing. So this week we're gonna be noticing new choices that Hemingway is making. Can you, do you remember what I said about the iceberg last week? Uh, nope. Okay, so Hemingway, this is a picture of him. Um, he writes like an iceberg. So on the top of, a, of an iceberg, there's just a really small amount that you can see. And then underwater is a huge amount of iceberg that you can't see. And Hemingway's writing is the same. He packs in so much into a very small amount of space, um, but there's a lot of meaning to interpret. And so we're gonna keep looking at this iceberg, going back over some things that we've read. Okay, remember this chart? 
we did this last week and you summarized it perfectly. Robert Wilson is experienced. He's an outdoorsman. We learned that from his clothes. He's strict and he's harsh. He beats some of the boys that work for him. Francis is cowardly. He's very insecure. He asks a lot of questions of, Fran of Robert Wilson. And he's got new clothes. And then Mrs. McCumber, beautiful, self-aware. She's sarcastic and she's a little bit attracted to Wilson. And you're going to see more of that today. Okay. Yuhan, this was your paragraph last week. I, I put it up here. Will you read it for us so we can remember what last week was all about? In the short, happy life of Francis McCumber, Hemingway writes about a lion hunt gone wrong. The author uses dialogue to char characterize Miss McCumber as very self-aware of her reputation. For example, she always says how she's embarrassed of her husband because what he has done. Francis attempts to make a joke about having a red face, but what he means is that he is also embarrassed. Mrs. McCumber, on the other hand, says she has a red face because she's ashamed of his cowardly behavior. Francis's actions are cowardly and insecure. For example, when he comes back from the lion hunt, some of his characters don't acknowledge his achievement of killing the lion. Hemingway, Hemingway contrasts these two characters in order to show the strength in the marriage. Excellent job. And you did a great job noting details, especially about that red face and the double meaning behind that. Okay, we're going to look at how an author uses shifts in perspective. So perspective means the thoughts, the feelings, and the actions of characters in a story. So Wilson's perspective, McCumber's perspective, and Mrs. McCumber's perspective. This story is third person omniscient. That's the point of view, which is slightly different from perspective. So that the point of view refers to Hemingway and how Hemingway is writing it. So he's writing this story from a third person omniscient perspective, meaning that he has every, he can go into every single character's mind. He can kind of do whatever he wants. Omniscient means he knows everything. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yuhan or should I explain it again? makes sense. Okay. So there's going to be a lot of different perspectives in this story because Hemingway is omniscient. He can see everything, know everything that's happening in his story. Okay. We're going to look at this passage from last week. And I want you to be thinking as we're reading, as I read this, whose perspective is represented in this scene? Okay, and then I'm going to ask you a couple more questions. Here comes the Mem Sahib, he said, and that is an upper class white woman. So that refers to who? Who might be the Mem Sahib, Yuhan? Susan McCumber. Exactly, yeah. She was walking over from her tent looking refreshed and cheerful and quite lovely. She had a very perfect oval face, so perfect that you expected her to be stupid. But she wasn't stupid, Wilson thought. No, not stupid. How is the beautiful red-faced Mr. Wilson? Are you feeling better, Francis, my pearl? Oh, much, said Miss McCumber. I've dropped the whole thing, she said, sitting down at the table. What importance is there to whether Francis is any good at killing lions? That's not his trade. That's Mr. Wilson's trade. Mr. Wilson is re really very impressive, killing anything. You do kill anything, don't you? Oh, anything, said Wilson, simply anything. They are, he thought, the hardest in the world, the hardest, the cruelest, the most predatory, and the most attractive, and their men have softened or gone to pieces nervously as they hardened. Or is it that they pick men they can handle? They can't know that much at the age they marry, he thought. 
He was grateful for he had gone through his education on American women before now, because this was a very attractive one. We're going after Buff in the morning, he told her. Okay, whose perspective, whose thoughts, feelings, actions are really focused on in this scene? Yuhan? Um, How do you know that? You're right. Because it's his thoughts. Yeah, what's an example of that? Like, don't know. Look at the end of the beginning paragraph. She wasn't stupid, Wilson thought. No, not stupid. Okay, what's Wilson thinking in this section? What's he thinking about as Mrs. McCumber comes over? Um, she's thinking about her physical features, like her face and head. Yeah, what does he think about her? That she's like very beautiful. Yeah, the most attractive. Yeah. And then also he says she's the hardest and the cruelest, the most predatory and the most attractive. So he's actually in his mind thinking about American women in that section. Because you see at the end it says he was grateful that he had gone through his education on American women before because this was a very attractive one. Okay, now this is a harder question. What is the impact of going inside Mr. Wilson's thoughts about Mrs. McCumber? Why did Hemingway make that choice? We could have gone into Miss, we could have gone into Mrs. McCumber's, we could have gone into Francis McCumber's. What's the impact of having Wilson talk about her? You can guess, it's okay if you don't know. I just wanna hear what you think. Basically shows like the, don't know. If that's a hard question, isn't it? Um. Okay, so I think the impact of having Mr. Wilson's perspective represented here is he's really keyed in on what she looks like and he's getting a snap impression of her because he doesn't know her well. Think about if we had this scene from Francis's point of view, it would be very different. They've been married 10 years. He knows a lot more information about her. Wilson's almost like an impartial observer. He doesn't know anything about her. And so we're getting kind of a very quick picture of her. Does that make sense? And we're also understanding that Wilson is attracted to her. Okay, let's move on. All right, we're gonna look a little more at Margot and Wilson and then some shifts in perspective. Are you ready? You excited? I'm excited. All right, let's go to page um, 10. Do, do you, why don't you take one minute and get your classwork open and then your story open. And then when you're, when you're there, just go ahead and type in the chat there. I'll put on a timer.
All right, you there, Johan? Yuhan, did you manage to navigate there? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna look at page 10. Why not let up on the bitchery just a little, Margot? McCumber said, cutting the Elon steak, and that's Elon's a type of animal, and putting some mashed potato, gravy, and carrot on the downturned fork that timed through the piece of meat. I suppose I could, she said, since you put it so prettily. She's being sarcastic. Tonight we'll have champagne for the lion, Wilson said. It's a bit too hot at noon. Oh, the lion, Margot said. I'd forgotten the lion. So Robert Wilson thought to himself, she is giving him a ride, isn't she? Or do you suppose that's her idea of putting up a good show? How should a woman act when she discovers her husband is a bloody coward? She's damn cruel, but they're all cruel. They govern, of course, and to govern, one has to be cruel sometimes. Still, I've seen enough of their damn terrorism. Have some more Elon, he said to her politely. Okay, whose perspective, whose inner thoughts do we hear in that little section? What? I didn't hear that. Can, is, am I cutting out? Mm, for just like one second. Oh, okay. My question was, whose perspective, whose thoughts did we hear in that one little section? Um, Wilson again. Wilson again. And what's Wilson saying here about her? What does Wilson think about, what does he think that she's doing here? Okay, let's take a look at the line where it says, so Robert Wilson thought to himself. So before that, she says, oh, the lion, I'd forgotten the lion. Do you think she forgot about the lion, Yuhan? No. How is she actually feeling about the lion? We talked about this last week. Still mad and embarrassed. Exactly. So Robert Wilson thought to himself, she is giving him a ride, isn't she? How should a woman act when she discovers her husband is a bloody coward? So what does that mean? She's giving McCumber a ride. What do you think that means? Don't know. What's that? Don't know. Maybe she's being sarcastic. She's kind of um, being mean to McCumber. Is there any other confirmation that she's being mean on purpose to him? No, it's just that she's sarcastic. Look where he says she's damn cruel, but they're all cruel. He's talking about all women there. Okay, let's look at our classwork. Let's answer this one to get, together. So why does Hemingway continue to give us information about Margot through Wilson's perspective? So we're learning that Wilson is beginning to realize Margo is taking McCumber for a ride, meaning she's being cruel, hateful, and sarcastic to her husband. So what do we learn about Margo? How does we learn what about Margo and how she feel really feels about McCumber? Maybe that it's that he It's okay. Do you need help? Yeah. We learn that she really hates her husband. 
when he's unable to be quote unquote masculine. and show bravery. Okay. What do we learn about Wilson here? I think, well, I think we learn, how does, okay, let me put it this way. How does Win Wilson feel about women in general? He thinks a lot about women. Wilson is like, knows a lot of doubt uh, yeah okay i'm gonna add he thinks about them a lot for sure i agree with that nice answer he says still i've seen enough of their damn terrorism he thinks women are terrorists in the way that they talk to men basically so I'm gonna add something like Wilson maybe doesn't trust women and thinks they terrorize their men. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So we're learning a lot about McCumber and Margot's relationship, but through another person. And he's able to really see through their words that they actually, there's a lot of cracks to their marriage, right? Yes. Okay, let's continue. We're gonna do this next section together. Um, do you wanna read this one right here, starting right here, that afternoon late? Now we're gonna start to shift perspectives. So I want you to be thinking, okay, we've gone out of Wilson's brain whose brain are we about to go into? Okay, that's gonna happen over the next couple pages. Okay, go ahead and start where it says that afternoon. Do you see where I'm at right there? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Oh, that's okay, I do that all the time. After that afternoon late, Wilson and McCumber went out in the motor car with a native driver and two gun bearers. Mrs. McCumber stayed in the camp. It was too hot to go out, she said. And she was going with them in the early morning. As they drove off, Wilson saw her standing under the big tree, looking pretty rather than beautiful in her fainty, rosy, tight, cocky. Khaki. Mm hmm not mm, her dark hair dropped back off her forehead and gathered in a knot low on her neck. Her face as fresh, she thought, as though she were in England. She whipped to them as the car went off through the swell of high grass and curved around through the trees into the small hills of orchard woof. Okay, there goes Wilson looking at her beauty again. In the orchard bush, they found a herd of impala. And leaving the car, they stalked one old ram with long, widespread horns, and McCumber killed it with a very credible shot that knocked the buck down at a good 200 yards and sent the herd off bounding wildly and leaping over one another's backs in long, leg-drawn-up leaps, as unbelievable and as floating as those one makes sometimes in dreams. That was a good shot, Wilson said. They're a smaller target. Is it a worthwhile head, McCumber asked? Meaning, am I gonna get praise for what I shot? It's excellent, Wilson told him. You shoot like that and you'll have no trouble. Do you think we'll find buffalo tomorrow? There's a good chance of it. They feed out early in the morning and with luck, we may catch them in the open. I'd like to clear away that lion business, McCumber said. It's not very pleasant to have your wife see you do something like that. Oh, what does that mean, Yuhan? How's McCumber feeling? Oh my gosh. 
what does he mean? I'd like to clear away that line business. He like doesn't want to remember it. Exactly. Exactly. I should think it would be even more unpleasant to do it, Wilson thought, wife or no wife, or to talk about it having done it. But he said, I wouldn't think about that anymore. Anyone could be upset by his first line. That's all over. All right, you're going to start right here with this paragraph. But that night. But that night after dinner and a whiskey and soda by the fire before going to bed. As Francis would come really on his cot with the mosquito bar over him and listen and listen to the night music, it was not all over. It was neither all over nor was it beginning. It was there exactly as it happened, but some parts of it in the night were rectified. And he was miserably ashamed at it. But more than shame he felt cold, hollow fear in him. The fear was still there like a cold, slimy hollow in all the emptiness. For once his confidence had been, and it made him feel sick. It was still there with him now. Okay, last paragraph. Go ahead and read. It had started the night before when he had awakened and heard the lion roaring somewhere up along the river. It was a deep sound, and at the end there was sort of coughing grunts that, even, that made him seem just outside the tent. And when Francis McCumber woke in the night to hear it, he was afraid. He could hear his wife breathing quietly asleep. There was no one to tell he was afraid nor to be afraid with him. And lying alone, he did not know that the Somali proverb was his a brave man is always frightened three times by a lion when he first sees his track, when he first sees a marauder, and when he first confronts him. Then, while they were eating breakfast by lantern light out in the dining tent, before the sun was up, the lion roared again, and Francis thought he was just at the end of camp. Okay. Whose perspective have we now entered on this page? Francis McCumbers. Yeah. And what are we learning about Francis here? What's the main idea that he's, what's Francis thinking about? He's very afraid of the line because he can hear it. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Let's add that into our classwork. So how does Hemingway signal a shift in perspective on this page? So let's restate that question. A shift in, sorry, Hemingway signals a shift in perspective on this page by going into McCumber's brain. Okay, did you notice something, Yuhan, here? Where it said, it had started the night before when he had wakened and heard the lion roaring. What just happened? It had started the night before. The flashback, the flashback. excellent, yeah. So we flash back, or um, the story and now we're going to actually see what happened with the lion hunt. Okay, this is a hard question. Why do you think we now hear about the lion hunt and Francis through Francis's eyes. The first part of the story was kind of through Wilson and he's sizing up Francis, he's sizing up Mrs. McCumber and their relationship. Why hear the lion hunt now through Francis's eyes? I don't know. Okay. What do you think he's trying to, what do you think Hemingway is trying to emphasize on this page about Francis? 
you kind of said it before. That he's such a coward? Yeah, he's really trying to emphasize the fear. How would this be different if we heard it from Wilson's perspective, Yuhan? We wouldn't know exactly why McCumber was afraid. Good. And is Wilson afraid of lions? No. Exactly. So we're hearing, we hear about the lion hunt through McCumber's perspective. in order to see his fear. And what did you say, how cowardly he is? Yeah. And to understand why he was so afraid. I think that the way you put that was perfect. So we're getting a little more motivation, a little more character detail. Okay, does that make sense? I also want to name that this is a really challenging text. So the fact that you're able to come up with some ideas is really awesome. You should feel very good about that because like I said, Hemingway is an iceberg. We're just trying to figure out what all that frozen stuff is underneath the iceberg. So really good work. It's it, he's tough. All right. Page 12 and 13. I'm going to have you read that um, by yourself. Okay. And we are on, now we're flashback. We're on the day of the lion hunt, okay? So I want you to read 12 and 13, and I'm gonna give you a few minutes to answer this question. What's different about Francis and Margot's relationship on these pages before the lion hunt? Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. I'll give you a, about five minutes and then I'll see what you say. Okay, about two and a half minutes. Is that going to be enough time for you? Yeah, I just got to read a bit more. Okay.
All right, last minute and then we'll talk. Are you finished reading? Yes. Okay, do you want a little think time to type first? Yeah. Okay, you okay? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Yuhan, can you do me a favor? Yeah. Can you copy and paste the link to your doc in the chat so I can click on it? Your work is not popping up right now. I'm on a different computer that's not loading the work very properly. Uh, which, which What's that? Which one do you want me to send? Um, the classwork that you're typing in. Right now? Yeah. Thank you. I gotta type the first two. Okay, yeah, just send it to me. It might take me a few seconds to get it open, actually. We gotta do the first two. I don't know if the link will work. It's okay, let me try it. All right, do you want me to give you a little bit of time to go back and answer one and two as well? Okay, let's come back to number two, okay? We kind of already talked that through. Um, can you say what you mean in, read your answer to number three and tell me what you mean by that? I didn't finish this, but it's more stable, the relationship, because um, 
Francis's wife is still like confident and not like mad at him for being embarrassing. How do you know that their relationship is more stable here? They're not like well, her dialogue is like no longer sarcastic and like targeted. Ooh, I like that answer. Can you add that? The dialogue is no longer targeted and sarcastic, almost like passive aggressive. She was kind of being passive aggressive before. You know what that means? When you're kind of not like saying why you're upset, but the person knows you're upset and sarcastic. Did you know what she calls him too? She says, darling he calls her darling and then she says you'll kill him marvelously i know you will so she feels pretty she feels pretty um she seems really supportive and and really confident of his abilities which she's not after the lion hunt we should add that too. I'll, I'll add that. How is McCumber feeling though on that page? He's also feeling like frightened. He's frightened, yeah. He's so nervous and it says he's nervous, he's miserable, yeah. So already the two of them are really disconnecting. Okay, nice, you did a good job on that. There are my pictures of, what do you think of my picture of Francis? I tried. <laughs> I spent a while looking for that. <laughs> Okay, um, I had us reading kind of a large chunk, but since it's just me and you, we can read together. Well, let me ask, do you prefer reading together or reading by yourself? By yourself? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have you do question number four. So, Actually, let's do four and five, okay? And um, just read through page 18. So the perspective's gonna shift a couple more times. So reading through page 18 and then four and five, and um, I'll put seven minutes on the clock for this one.
All right, that was about six minutes. What page are you on now? Okay, what page did you get to, you, hon? Uh, I'm reading like 18 right now. Okay. All right. What's per, what other perspectives shift during this? Well, whose perspective do we get in this hunt scene? Francis's. We get Francis's. Yep. And then did you notice whose perspective was on page 15? Yeah, it was the lion. It was the lion. Yeah. That that's kind of weird, right? I didn't think we would get see the lion's perspective. Okay. So you said, can you explain what you mean by uh your answer number four? Um basically means that uh, it shows that McCumber hit the target because on like the end of the uh, like around the end of the perspective it says it's basically giving the details of the paint that the line felt after he got shot and that he didn't see McCumber and that he was like pretty far away. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what is the problem wasn't shooting the lion. What's McCumber's cowardliness? What can he not do? He can't like get close to it. Yeah. He's like afraid to actually kill it, finish killing it. The other thing, I totally agree with you. Did you see this line on the top of 15? The lion still stood looking majestically and coolly towards this object that his eyes only showed in silhouette. So if you're looking, he's looking at Francis majestically. So that's a very positive um, adjective about the lion. And it almost makes Francis seem like he um, is, how do I want to word this? Francis is like the animal in this scene. Does that make sense? 
because we're treating the, the lion has this almost like regal perspective. The lion in the beginning is the one in control. Yeah. And Francis is the one who's afraid, cowardly. The lion is kind of looking at him like, I dare you to shoot me. I'm regal. I'm majestic. I'm, I have, I'm looking at you very coolly from a distance. It's almost like the lion judges Francis. Okay, did you get um, number five? No, not yet. Wilson's perspective. My clue for you is look at the bottom of page 17. And I'm gonna add this one little part about the line. All right, do you see where we get Robert Wilson's perspective? Yes. Can you read it for us? Like, from where, like the last paragraph? Yeah. Robert Wilson, whose entire occupation had been with Biden, the problem he presented and who had not been thinking about the number, except could note that he was rather windy, suddenly felt as though he had opened the wrong door in the hotel and seen something shameful. Okay. And that's following right after McCumber said, or Wilson said, you don't have to go in, meaning you don't have to go into the bush to kill the lion by hand. He said, that's what I'm hired for. You know, that's why I'm so expensive. And then McCumber says, you mean you'd go in by yourself? Why not leave him there? What's Robert Wilson's reaction to that? Or like that he's um he's prepared if Francis doesn't want to like do anything. Yeah, Robert Wilson's gonna do it, that's his job. When Francis says, you mean you'd go in there by yourself? What's he saying there? Like, what's he surprised by? He's like surprised that he would like risk to go in there by himself. Yeah, exactly. And would Francis risk that? No. No, not at all. And so the fact that he asked that, Robert Wilson, it says it feels like he opened the wrong door to a hotel and see something shameful. So what is dawned on Robert Wilson now when he, when Francis asked that question? What's the shameful thing he's now realizing about Francis? That he's very cowardly and doesn't want to like get in situations. Exactly. And now this makes so much sense. If you go back to the beginning, remember how Robert Wilson was kind of judging Francis in his mind the whole time? Yes. This part of the story in the middle in the flashback is really the first time Robert Wilson has this kind of epiphany like, oh man, the person that has hired me to help him go on this safari, he's really afraid. He didn't know that before. So he's seen a shameful thing. Francis just wants to leave the lion there to suffer and to possibly hurt someone else. Okay. So Hemingway shows Wilson's perspective in this section. I'll give you, I'll give you a few minutes to answer that in your own words, that one.
Okay. Do you need a little help? Yes. Okay. What is Wilson's perspective on Francis here? That he's starting to show signs that he is very afraid. Yes. Good. So go ahead and type that. That's 100% right. His cowardliness. That's that's a tough word. His cowardliness. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Cowardness. Cowardliness. Yeah, it's an I. Okay, good. How does Hemingway? Okay, so we saw the moment where his thoughts were reported. Very brief on the bottom of 17. How does Hemingway develop his character? That's a much harder question. Well, I think what we can say to that, he has this idea of cowardliness is something shameful. So we're starting to see that Wilson has an idea that being brave is something positive and being a coward is something that you need to be ashamed of. So not showing bravery is bad, unwanted, undesirable, and shameful to Wilson. And that's, I think, a development there. Frankly, I would be more like McCumber. I'm not gonna go in and kill that lion. I'm not a Wilson. What about you? I don't know. You think you'd go in and kill the lion? I don't know. Okay, interesting. Are you brave, Yuhan? Not that one. <laughs> well, I mean, that's really that's really hard. Okay. Um. All right. We're gonna skip 19 through 21. Um, I wanted to tell you what your homework is this week is to finish the story. And there's a couple questions on Google Classroom. <coughs> oh, make sure I get there. Um, okay, so there's homework this week and it's to finish the story. And then there's a couple questions I'd like you to answer. And then we're gonna go over the story in more detail next week because we're going to pick apart some parts of the story okay and you're going to see how this is resolved so we come out of the flashback and how is this tension between wilson and mrs mccumber francis and margo how is their relationship resolved and then of course francis and wilson how is that resolved okay um, we're going to do our final right here. I want you to type your ideas here at the bottom. So the final right question is, how does Hemingway use changes in perspective of various characters to develop the characters of McCumber and Wilson? All right, do you want to talk that through before you get started? Yeah. Okay. So in the section that we read today, what are the perspectives that this section shifted between? Like, oh, can you say it again? I didn't hear it. Yeah. Whose perspectives are represented? We started out hearing. Uh, it was from page put on me. From page 11, it was still Wilson's, and then it changed, wait, no, it was Francis's, and then it changed to the lines, and then the Wilson's. Exactly. Okay, so what are we learning 
in those shifts. I think the biggest one you can focus on in this paragraph is when we change to Francis's and go into the flashback. Okay, you should talk about that. Does that make sense? Why would we, what are we learning about going into McCumber's perspective? For the line, for example. All right, is this hard? Mm, yeah. It is, okay. Hopefully you're, you feel like you're getting support. It is pretty tough. All right, do you want me to help you get started? Yes, I'm good at you. Okay, so in this section, Hemingway changes perspective from blank to blank. You know that. All right, do you wanna give a little time to think of this on your own and maybe we can talk about it next week? Yeah. Okay. Let's wrap up there and I'll see you next week. Okay. Okay. And your job is to finish up the story and um, finish this paragraph and I'll take a look at it. Okay. Bye. Hey, good work today. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye.